Fucking like Siegel, for start. <laughs> Why? Because he's not here. No. Go ahead. Have okay. It. Go for it. Give us two jokes about it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is Scalding. I uh, appreciate the, uh, what uh, Paco had to say about laying the foundation for uh, cascading. And I think you'll see, hopefully by example, uh, why some of the things he was talking about in terms of the nice qualities of Scalding will be evident. I'm going to show you a lot of code. I don't expect you to follow it all, especially since it's Scala, but uh, you can certainly download the slides and hopefully they'll make sense uh, when you read the speaker notes and just remember what I said. Um, a little bit about me, I work for Think Big Analytics, which is a you know, big data consultancy, mostly focusing on Hadoop, but pretty much the whole ecosystem, uh, based actually near where he lives in California, although there's a bunch of us here in Chicago. Uh, here's my email address if you want to contact me, my Twitter handle. We have uh, some open source uh, projects on GitHub, and actually there's a scalding workshop that I did on, on this GitHub account if you want to try it out yourself. It's like a half day you know, walk through kind of workshop. And I've got a few other projects, uh, and actually including these presentations are also in my GitHub account. And I wrote these three books on, on, uh, for O'Reilly, and as you might be able to tell from the titles, I'm a big fan of Scala, I'm a huge fan of functional programming, and I'll try to make the case for that as we go along. And uh, I'm also uh, you know, a passionate believer in Hive as far as being a really important tool in our ecosystem. Uh, and speaking of such things, I'm actually doing a couple of Hive classes uh, here in Chicago uh, beginning of March, a one-day intro to Hive, and then a, an advanced course on Hive this one day on the 7th and 8th. You can attend both if you want, but um, obviously the second one's for people with some experience. And I'm also doing that one before Strata for those of you that happen to be, be in California. If you want more information, look at this uh, bit.ly Think Big Events link to find out. All right, I have a question for you. How many of you have all the time in the world to get your work done? Never, never any pressure. Bueller, Bueller. Okay, then I, what I want to know is why are we writing code like this? Um, so Paco showed a word count. This is a uh, this is a word count in the uh, Java MapReduce API. Um, I'm sure everybody in the back of the room can read this just fine. Actually, I'm not even showing you all the code. Um, I'm not showing you the main routine that sets up the Hadoop job and sacrifices the versions and all the other stuff you have to do with Hadoop. Um, let's zoom into this just a little bit. Obviously, I'm not going to walk through all this, but um, this is word count. It's a very simple algorithm. If you're not sure what that means, all it is is I want to read a bunch of documents, I want to find all the words, and I want to count the occurrences of the words. Uh, it's a classic hello world kind of exercise for Java programmers and Hadoop. Uh, but it's actually an interesting uh, algorithm for word processing. For example, if you're doing a spelling checker and I type T-H-E-X, uh, you probably know that I meant the uh, because that's a very common word in English and that sort of thing. Let's zoom in just a little bit. Uh, and what I want to uh, call out here, not so much the actual uh, content here, but I'm using green to indicate all the types. And this is typical Java that just you know, type diarrhea all over the place. Um, and unfortunately, most of these types are infrastructure types that really don't have anything to do that much with the problem we're trying to solve, but just a lot of stuff that we have to sacrifice to the uh, volcano god in order to make it happy. Um, whereas the yellow operations are the actual things that do work. They're the operations like, you know, grab this, do that. And that's really what we want to focus on is getting our work done. So you're going to see these colors kind of evolve as we go through this talk. Uh, and if you really want to know what's going on with this code, I'd be happy to discuss it with you later over copious alcohol quantities. In my opinion, your tools ought to do a few things for you. They ought to minimize boilerplate uh, by exposing the right abstractions. And the ideal abstractions would be exactly the kinds of things that you want to do with data. And guess what? We've been doing this for a long time. Most of those abstractions we already have in SQL, the things like mapping over data, filtering, selecting, you know, projecting, um, joining, grouping by, and all that kind of stuff. That's what we really want to do most of the time with data. And by the way, that's mathematics, in case you hadn't figured that out. In fact, SQL is essentially based on the relational model, as we all know, more or less, uh, and that's based on set theory. So you can't escape math, unfortunately. The other thing we want our tools to do is maximize our expressiveness and our extensibility. 
what I mean by these two words are, I really want to be able to tell the tool in a concise way exactly what I need done. And I don't want to have to you know, sacrifice to the volcano gods or anything like that. I just want to say it and get it done. And I will, but also, you know, I know that no tool is ever going to give me everything I need to do my job. So what I'd really like is a great way to extend the tool uh, when it doesn't quite do what I need so that I can move on. Now, the Hadoop Java API is great for extensibility. It's really an assembly language for Hadoop. I can do anything that I really want to if I sacrifice enough versions to the volcano gods. But it's not so great for really making it easy to express things that I want to do, like joins, which are a very simple concept and easy to write in SQL, but are a nightmare to write in MapReduce. So what are we going to do about this? Well, we already saw one great solution uh, that Paco described, and that's cascading, which was invented to raise the abstraction level and to expose the kinds of abstractions we like to do with data and not allow us to get all the abolic stuff with the uh, infrastructure. So uh, actually, this is the second example of cascading doing word count you've seen tonight. Uh, it's also rather small, and I apologize for that. But in fact, that there's a few really great advantages here, even though we haven't really lost that much in the word count. Actually, we have lost quite a bit. Well, word count, I've actually overloaded that term. I meant word count as lines of code count. Actually, this is the entire program, except for a few imports, including the main routine. So in one sense, it is smaller than the other example. But the other great thing about this code, and I'll drill into it in just a second to just highlight a few details, um, is that there's a lot less infrastructure in your face and a lot more domain problem I'm trying to solve, like building up a workflow, like you described, to let me do my job, to actually do a work count. So if I drill into this a little bit, just very concisely what's going on here without really getting into a lot of details, I'm going to set up my job by with some properties and build up a, a workflow. Um, then I'm going to you know, define my input and output uh, schemas and also my, uh, my sources and sinks of data, in this case into HDFS. That's what the HFS thing is all about. And then I'm going to build up this assembly of pipes that I'm going to stream data through and do some processing and so forth. One of the things I'd like you to notice here is, for those of you that can read the, the slide, Notice in the middle there's things like assembly equals new each, assembly equals new group by, and so forth. Um, cascading goes about as far as you can go in Java to really expose abstractions in the right way, but you do hit this wall eventually where everything has to be some sort of ad hoc class. So all these little things like each and group by and count and every that you see on this slide, these are all really just operations. There's really not really any good reason why they should be classes. They should just be operations that I apply to a stream of tuples. And that's what we're going to see when we get to scalding is that these classes, all of these types, go away, or at least they're hidden from us. And we can just talk about piping data through operations. I have a little diagram that I wrote uh, for a class a long time ago. I thought I'd throw it in here just to uh, make use of it. But anyway, this is essentially pictorially what's going on with word count, where we're building up a flow. We're going to pipe uh, data into this each operator that's going to apply a regular expression to tokenize the lines into words. We're going to group over the words so that we have each word in some group, as it were, pretty much the way you would do a SQL. And then we're going to count. count. We're going to count the size of each group and then write that to the output. So the output will be tab delimited data with each word maybe sorted in by alphabetical order if we really want that, and then the count of each word. It's actually a lot of fun to run this on some things like works of Shakespeare and stuff like this. So anyway, the nice thing about cascading this is it raises this abstraction level. Uh, it's still kind of wordy because Java is wordy, and all those, t those explicit type declarations are unavoidable in Java. But nonetheless, at least we're a little closer to a domain-specific language for data flows. So our next option is actually to go to Scalding. Actually, you've seen this already. This is, in fact, the entire application written in Scalding. It's about a dozen lines of code. You could write this once you knew this API in a matter of a few minutes, and, and once you've tested it, you'd be done. Whereas the original Java MapReduce program was you know, a couple hundred lines of code. 
The infrastructure has practically completely disappeared at this point. The green types are largely gone uh, because uh, Scala infers types and also because it really emphasizes in its collection model the notion of transforming data, mapping it, filtering it, flat mapping it. I'll actually explain what's in this code in a few minutes, but I just want to get, give you the gist of it now. So notice there's a lot more yellow now and a lot less green. And it's not that the Twitter guys are brilliant necessarily, although there's some really smart dudes that are working on this. It's just that uh, Scala makes it a lot easier to write this kind of logic. And just for comparison, let's see what this looks like in Hive and Pig. Here's the same thing in Hive. Now it turns out this is not exactly a typical scenario for a structured query language query. And I'm actually exploiting some features in Hive like nesting arrays inside records. I, I'm not going to explain this at all. I'd be happy to go over this with anybody. but. You know, here's what, 10 lines or something less than that, I guess, including creating a table that points to some data in HDFS and then writing a query over it that uses some built-in functions that the things in yellow are actually built-in functions in Hive. That does a very trivial tokenization of the uh, lines into words and then group by and then counts them. And it's over really fast. Those of you that know pig, here you go, here's pig. It's about the same size as the hive code. Again, very concise. I won't go into a lot of details about what's going on here, but it's pretty much the same sort of thing. The beauty of hive and pig, of course, is that they're purpose-built language for particular needs, and they're really great at expressing things like this that fit nicely into their model. Or why do we need something else? Is that the question? Well, it actually goes back to what I mentioned about extensibility. Both, of, both languages, Hive and Pig, they're great if you have what you already need there, but as soon as you need to extend them, then you have to uh, you know, jump over this barrier of being able to write Java code according to a particular API. Pig is a little more flexible. You could actually use Python, Ruby, uh, JavaScript now, and maybe, maybe some others. So it's, extensibility is possible, and you know, there are experts at Twitter that do a lot of this sort of thing with Pig. There are also big Pig users, for example. But it is a little bit of a barrier, whereas that Scala code I showed you, if I need to write some custom function, I just write it right in there. It's just Scala code. I don't care. There's no real barrier other than the barrier of learning Scala, which I admit is not trivial. But yes, I'm going to come back, back actually at the end and make a few final comments comparing these three languages um, just from my own experience. Okay, let's take a step back for a second and ask what is Scala and what is Scalding. This, by the way, is the arch in St. Louis, or a piece of it anyway. Scala is a modern, concise, object-oriented functional language for the JVM. And uh, you can, of course, you can Google it, but uh, here's the link to the Scala language website if you want it. So let me uh, look at these terms one at a time and describe what they mean. It's modern. It reflects 20 years of evolution in language design and software engineering concepts since Java's invention. It's hard to believe in a way, but Java's almost 20 years old now. It probably is 20 years old if you, you know, as far as when the both language, its predecessor, got started. So it, a lot has happened in 20 years. Java was really definitely the state of the art at the time, although, of course, it was stealing ideas from other languages like Lisp, Smalltalk, garbage collection, and virtual machines, and all that. But we've really learned a lot since then about how to design languages uh, in, in many directions, and in a way, Java is really showing its age. In part, and it, it has the classic problem of you can't just completely arbitrarily change things. There's always backwards compatibility concerns. And Java has always been very concerned about backwards compatibility for good reason. It's extremely concise. Uh, in part because in first types, in a lot of scenarios, you don't have to put in the type so-called annotations like you always do in Java. Uh, Scala has a bunch of interesting little built-in idioms to make common things that you do much more concise than normal. Even declaring simple like structural classes that like hold little fields and don't have much behavior, it can be extremely concise for that. But it also fully embraces uh, functional programming ideas, which I'll get to in just a second, in both its APIs and its design techniques. So it just, if you take the same uh, Scala, uh, sorry, Java code port to Scala without really changing it conceptually, it tends to be much more concise in the end just because of the way the language is designed. 
again, reflecting years of uh, learning about language design. It turns out the creator of Scala, Mark Nagurski, has been working on the Java business for a long time. And in fact, the Java C that we use today is based on a prototype compiler he built about a decade ago now. So he knows what he's doing in this regard. Contrary to the trend that's really going on right now in language design, it fully embraces object oriented programming. And what he's done is fix a lot of the flaws in Java, Java's object model. I wish I had time to go into some of this stuff in more detail, but some of the things they've built into it radically improve the ability of the language to compose stuff, to uh, support reuse, and things like that. And one of the key concepts is the notion of traits, which are like reusable mix-ins of code. But at the same time, Scala believes that you can combine this other paradigm, functional programming, which has really gotten popular in the last five or so years, although it's actually the oldest programming paradigm we have, going all the way back to Lisp in the late 50s, but even all the way back to the 20s with some of the pioneering work in mathematics and functions and computation, people like Church and uh, Haskell Curry and those guys. I want to make the case today, actually, if you don't get anything out of this talk other than what's in this slide, I think you'll be far better off, and that is that Functional programming is a natural fit for data. All the stuff that we're doing with Java today is, in my view, uh, a misdirection. It's actually taking us in the wrong path. We should be using functional programming because everything we're doing with data is effectively mathematical manipulation. Whether you're you know, filtering or mapping over data or transforming it in any way, uh, grouping, joining, all that stuff are really just operations on sets at the, at the root of things. And when you embrace a paradigm that's based on mathematics, and the word functional here, I didn't say this, but what it really means is functional in the sense of how math functions work, which is actually different from the way we're used to thinking of computers functions, uh, software functions. Anyway, the reason that scalding is so concise and elegant for expressing problems is because it embraces this model that um, the way we transform data in a functional way is actually much more effective for working with big data, or small data for that matter. And indeed, SQL is really kind of a stripped down form of functional programming. It's missing a lot of things that you would, be, uh, you would consider important in functional programming, like functions, <laughs> but uh, you know, that is functions you can write yourself in the language. But nevertheless, it, it embraces a lot of the same concepts. And actually, uh, functional programming started to get really interesting to us in the last few years, not because of big data per se, but because it's also really robust for building horizontally scalable systems, which, as I think all of you realize, is, is critically essential. There's probably not a computer in this room that doesn't have more than, like, one core. Even the phones in your pockets are now sporting two to four cores on them, much less this, this uh, laptop I have has something like seven cores on it or eight cores. It's insane. And the only way we can do that is with the proper idioms for concurrency and functional programming is really that. And I'd love to talk about that over beers as well. The last point, well said. Are you buying? Am I buying? Uh, yeah, I can drink shrimp. Drink shrimp, think big. Anyway. Um, That's on video. Uh, it's on video. Oh my god. I'm so, I'm so fired. Never mind. All right. The last point is, it's, it is a language for the JVM. It interoperates beautifully with Java, so does Clojure for that matter, so it's not like you have to throw away your infrastructure to use Scala. That's not to, mean, to say that it's trivial to switch to Scala. There are good reasons for being conservative about a language change, but it's, it's not that hard to do if you're already a JVM shop. And if you're a .NET shop, you should be looking at F Sharp, by the way. Okay, what is Scala? Well, I think you sort of know already, but just to summarize what's been said, it is a Scala big data library based on cascading that was uh, pioneered at Twitter, and they're very actively developing it. And actually, uh, Paco also mentioned Etsy. It turns out one of the, the guy at Twitter who started the Scalding project is now one of the lead developers at Etsy, so they're both really big contributors to this. Uh, the, the reason I phrase this as a library based on cascading is because it's it's not really just a thin veneer off the top of cascading idioms. In some ways, it departs fairly considerably from cascading, like some of the things it does with uh, specifying input and output. But for the most part, it follows the cascading model of data flows and computation. Um, 
Paco mentioned that uh, Clojure adds support for logic programming based on data log. Probably the main extension that uh, Scalding adds is a pretty nice matrix API that's really good for graph processing algorithms, machine learning, stuff like that. And you can imagine Twitter cares a lot about graph processing. And I didn't know he was going to mention Cascalog, so I put in this slide about uh, looking at Cascalog, which is also a beautiful language, a beautiful toolkit built on top of a beautiful language. And if you don't know this, it's actually, it actually was invented by the guy who later invented Storm, the, the event processing system, Nathan Mars, who also happens to be at Twitter now. Okay, uh, let me uh, ruin your eyes by showing you some more code. Uh, first, what we'll do is we'll go back to the example I showed you a minute ago. Just, I just conceptually want to give you a sense for what each step is in the code without uh, trying to explain everything there is to know about Scala. And then I'll show you a few other examples just to sort of fill it out, and then I'll uh, let you go. So, going back to our first example, the first thing you would do like we do in Java is import the library you need. Uh, one slight difference with Scala is that it uses underscore instead of star for this, you know, import everything at the end of this line. Uh, we create a class like you might in Java that it represents the job and extends the job <coughs> extraction. And the args thing in here is the argument list that's passed uh, to this job when you start it up in the command line. Uh, one little bit of Scala syntax. It turns out the whole body of a Scala class is the primary constructor. So if you have arguments for the constructor, you put the argument list after the name of the class. And so that's why you see an argument list after the name word count job here. We're just going to read in uh, data that's you know one line or one record per line. It's just text. Uh, the args is the, again what the user passed in, and if they said minus minus input some path, then that's what our input's going to be. We'll assume that's where our file is located or files. Uh, we'll open it. Notice there's a dot. Then we're going to call the read method on the stuff we just opened. Now this flat map thing is a little bit complicated, uh, at least syntactically. Let me explain what's going on by first starting with the <coughs> argument to flat map. Um, that little uh, single quote line, that's Scala's way of uh, indicating a symbol. If you've ever done Ruby programming, a symbol is written like colon line. If you still don't know what I mean by the word symbol, just think of these things as strings, and that's good enough. And what we're saying here is that we're going to name this single field that will be the, each record, each line. We'll just call it line. And then the output is going to be on the right side of this arrow. Everything that's coming out of this little blob in this uh, circle is going to be called a word field. So we're going to tokenize this line into words and expand it into more records. Now it turns out this thing in curly braces is actually an anonymous function. So if this were Java, you'd be doing like, you know, new interface, uh, you know, implement some method of the uh, usual anonymous center class stuff. As a matter of fact, that's what Scala is doing under the hood here, but it gives you this nice syntax for writing anonymous functions. The thing to the left of the orange double lined arrow is the argument list. It's a line type string. That's our line we're reading in. And then the stuff to the right of that little arrow that I put on the next line is just the body of the function, and all it does is what you would expect trims off white space, converts to lowercase, splits it on white space to convert to words. And then now back to the word flat map, what does that mean? Well, map would mean that I'm going to run this function on every single element of my collection. But what this uh, split thing is going to do is create a collection with each element. So I'd end up with a collection of collections. I don't want that. I just want one big flat collection. So that's what flat map does. It takes those little nested collections and flattens them to a big collection. So that's all that's going on. <coughs> all right, finally, we're back to something that if you know SQL will look familiar. We're going to group by the words so I can count them. So I'm just going to group by word, and then I'm going to count them. The argument to the size method here is just what I'm going to name that count field that comes out. So I'm going to compute the size of the group, call it a count, and then finally write it to a tab uh, delimited output file. And it'll be word count, word count, word count, one per line. So that's the gist of word count from Scalding. And, I, and I, it's my belief that once you understand what the API is doing and understand a little Scala syntax, you can pick this up really fast and be productive, much faster than learning the, the Duke Java API. I would even be willing to bet that non programmers could learn this syntax faster than they could learn uh, like a Java based syntax.
Although I say that with trepidation, because Scala can quickly uh, confuse you, uh, unfortunately, for reasons I won't go into. And then hopefully, profit at the end will come out of it for you. Uh, <laughs> okay, what do joints look like? What if I want to join a couple of uh, tables or the equivalent thereof? This is not too bad either. I will say this though, if you try to do, do joins of more than two data streams, I think it gets really ugly actually in scalding. That, that's something that I don't particularly like in the API. But nevertheless, it's not too terrible if you're just doing two. So what are we gonna do? Let's, let's just quickly walk through this. Imagine that we're just gonna pull in stocks and dividends data for say IBM or any single stock. I'm not gonna handle multiple stocks in this code. Because this is just Scala code, rather than uh, hard coding my schemas inside different places where I'm going to you know, transform stuff to records, I'll just declare a variable. This, uh, when you use the word val, the keyword val, it means this is a read-only variable. And this will just be a tuple, a three-element tuple that defines my schema for the stocks. And I'm going to assume that I'm going to have the year, month, and day. That's what S stocks year, month, and day is what that first field will be, the closing price and the volume. And then for the dividends, I'll assume it's uh, also year, month, and day data. And you can bet I'm going to be doing joins on the year, month, and day. And then the dividend field. And now we can build up a pipeline where I'll open up actually two pipes, one for stocks, one for dividends, both tab delimited. Notice that I'm passing the schemas and as the second argument after the args. That was, that's the command line argument again that tells me where to find this stuff. Then I read each one, and then for the stocks, I want to just project out. I want to select on the two fields I care about. I don't care about the volume, I'm just going to select on the year, month, and day and close. And then finally, I do a join. Join with tiny is basically map side join. It means that I know that the dividends is small, so that's my tiny data set, so I'm going to exploit that knowledge and use that as the right hand data set. Joining on the uh, year, month, and day from stocks, and the year, month, and day on dividends. So it's an inner join. You can do outer join, so we're just going with inner join. I'll have two date fields, so I just want to throw one away. That's this project call. It'll just select on one of them, and the closing price from stocks, the dividend value, the dividends, and then write the output. Now, how about, so I've written this little script. How would I actually run this? Well, in Scalding, there's a little driver script called ScaldRB. I'm actually suppressing a few details here, but just again to give you the gist. And I, this is like a bashed script. It's too long for one line, so I've wrapped it with a little back hashes, or back slashes, whatever, at the end of the line. But three arguments, you know, what's the stock file, what's the dividends file, and where should I write the output? And it turns out you get something like this. One thing I did not do in this uh, workflow is sort the data, so it actually this is the way it actually came out when I ran it about three hours ago. I'm, I'm a just-in-time slide writer. <laughs> Although obviously some of this stuff I uh, stole from other presentations, it wouldn't be this polished otherwise. All right, two more examples and then we'll quit. Let's do, and they'll be a little more sophisticated. One of the interesting things you do in natural language processing is look for so-called n-grams. So rather than looking for in individual words, I'd like to look for phrases. In this case, I'm gonna look at the plays of Shakespeare and look for all phrases, three, three word phrases that start with I love. And it could be anything, but I'm just gonna do I love because I'm, well it is after, after all it's Valentine's Day, so I guess that's, that's an appropriate. Okay, so let's just walk through this a little bit. Actually, this is our longest example. It actually goes over two slides and we'll back up and, and just walk through each one. But hopefully you're getting the sense of how the flow, if I can use that word, goes where there's a lot of yellow functions that are just glommed together one after another, this, dot, that, dot, so forth. Okay, I'll use a couple of my read-only variables to define some stuff that I may need, like they're gonna specify what the prefix is they wanna see. So this is where you would say, I wanna see all trigrams that start with I love, and the third part would be the word after that. So that's the n-gram prefix. How many do I want to keep? So if I'm looking over a huge data set, I could get you know hundreds, thousands of outputs. So maybe I just want to see the first 10 or something. By default, this, this syntax will let me not require the argument, but default to the top 10. And then I'm going to use a regular expression, which this is one way to create a regular expression in Scala, that will uh, be used to define those tri 
uh, gram expressions inside my text. So it's, it's sort of like word count is what we're doing here, but it's a little different. Uh, now here's something really wild. I can actually declare a variable that is a function. And this function, without going into a lot of detail, is going to take two tuples, you know, like a, a, a n-gram and a count of that n-gram and another n-gram and that count, and then sort them by the count. So I want to see the most frequent n-grams at the top, least frequent at the bottom. So this is a function. I'm going to pass this as an argument to another function in a minute. Again, I don't expect you to unfold the details, but just to get the gist of it. Now we're going to start building up our workflow. Once again, I'll read in some text. I'll do my flat map trick again. This time, instead of just outputting individual words, I'm actually going to look for these trigrams using that regular expression. The discard statement throws away fields I don't care about anymore. It's sort of the opposite of select. It's like select that uh, in the inverse. I just want to throw away the line number and the, the whole line and just keep the trigrams that I found. And then I'll group over those trigrams and count them. Then I have a last step. Now this is syntax uh, or behavior that might be familiar if you know pig. If you want to count something in pig, what you do is you, you group everything into a, a so-called bag and then count the bag. And basically they do the same thing here. I group all means put all of these n-grams into a single record or virtual record and then count them from there. And this is where I'm going to use my, my comparator that I saw that showed you on the earlier slides. You'll also see the word n. Oh, I thought I fixed this. No, oh, there's a typo here. Never mind. But the, the word keep in is how many I want to keep, which defaults to 10, and then I write the output. So that, this is our longest script. Run it in a very similar way. Notice I specify input, output, the prefix I want to look for, in this case, I love, and the count. And if you run this on the plays of Shakespeare, this is what you get. I love thee, I love you, isn't that sweet? I love him, et cetera. And I had a few in here I thought were amusing, like I love myself. Uh, I love playing with the n -grams. Oh, by the way, this is really easy to do in Hive, too, by the way. There's a bunch of nice built-in functions for n in Hive, so I do this kind of exercise in the class that I teach, because it's, a lot of, it's quite amusing to play with. In the class, we actually do it with Twitter data, so it's really amusing to play with these the n -grams in Twitter data. The last example is this matrix API I talked about. Um, let me set this up a little bit. So, Suppose that I'm building a recommendation engine. Like when you go to Netflix, you just watch a thousand movies, and they suddenly recommend another bunch of movies that you might like, and they're usually pretty close to being right about what you like. What are they doing? One of the ways you can do that is you can compare your recommendations, think of them as preferences, with everybody else's preferences in their database. And if it turns out that you happen to be very similar to other people, and they've watched movies you have not, then that's a really good thing for them to recommend to you because the chances are good that you'll have the same opinions. And one way to do it with math is to put all of these things in a matrix. So the matrix would have vectors where the vectors might represent all the movies, and there's one vector per person. If you remember your uh, geometry with like three dimensions, remember when you had two vectors in space, and you can't see me because it's dark, but just go with me on this. I'll use my arms. So if I have two vectors like this, and I do the cosine, you know, the angle between the two, that cosine is going to be very close to one if these vectors are pointing more or less in the same direction. But if my preferences are way different than yours, like I love, you know, uh, early flicks or whatever, you know, romance kind of movies, and you're into <laughs> slasher flicks or something, I don't know. What do you mean um, if? Say that again? What do you mean if you love? Well, hey, well okay, you know, I, I'm, okay, I'm giving away my preferences. But, um, you know, for, in other words, if our preferences are way different, then the angles of these vectors is way off, in which case the cosine is close to zero. And that's exactly what this calculation is doing, is uh, comparing, it's doing the equivalent of a cosine calculation between all the vectors in this data set. So, there's a little bit more input inputs we need now. We need this matrix API, imports rather. And here's a little trick. Notice the one in the middle here. You can actually do imports anywhere in Scala code. So you can scope an import to only where it's needed, which is a neat little trick. Mike Siegel, for start.
we're going to define some variables again for like the schema of the data that's coming in. And the way that uh, uh, Scalding does matrices is that it assumes it's one per line, and it's basically user one, user two, and whether or not they have a relation. So it's actually easily represents sparse matrices. And it's going to read in one cell at a time, and then it's in this last line in the circle, it's going to convert it to a matrix. So this is an API we get when we import this matrix stuff. The other trick we want to do is actually normalize all the vectors in the matrix. What does this mean? Well, normalization is just what you used to do in, in high school geometry when you computed the length of the hypotenuse, x squared plus y squared, and then take the square root. And that's all we're doing. We're computing the links and then dividing by the links so that all these things are basically unit vectors. You don't really need to understand all these details. I'm just trying to explain what's going on. And then it turns out when we take the transpose of this matrix, multiply it by itself, we've actually computed the cosine of all these vectors. Yes? Does it mean that reads the whole line reads in memory? I didn't quite hear you. Does that mean it reads the whole matrix in memory? Yeah. That's a good question. And I honestly don't know how they implement this. I don't think they require it all in memory because that wouldn't be terribly useful. I think there, there's various ways you can shard mem mem uh, matrices and do. I'm pretty sure that's what they're doing. But I honestly don't know the implementation. But that's it. When, once we've uh, normalized these vectors, we just make, uh, multiply them together like this and then write it out and we've got our cosines. Now I didn't actually uh, show an example of this, but um, I just wanted to give you a sense for how the matrix API works. I think you're just doing one line at a time. So you're just doing the inner product of the vectors, not the vectors. I know because the you're, you're treating the vectors as a matrix, but when you do the inner product of a, that one column matrix, it's the same as doing the inner product of a. Yeah. Technology is doing transpose at the same time. Yeah, but transpose of a, of a, of a vector is just right. you take a Yeah. If any of you have the um, Hoots book, the Manning book, they actually have a nice discussion of sharding linear algebra over a cluster. And I would recommend you look at that for ways you can do this for arbitrarily large matrices efficiently without doing one at a time with that. Okay, that's it for the code. You can breathe easily. I just want to make a few concluding remarks and then I'll uh, let you go. And that is first to talk about the, um, just to get uh, my thoughts about the comparison of these three tools. And since I know all three of them pretty well now from my teaching and my work at Think Big, I kind of just pick whichever one is easiest to use. I really think Hive is, is hard to beat if I just have questions I want to ask in my data. You know, if it's something that you naturally think of as a great candidate for a query, then just use Hive, at least if you know Hive. It's just so concise, it's really great for that. You do run into a problem pretty quickly that if you're trying to do things like sequencing transformations of data, or Hive doesn't have a lot of sophisticated built-in stuff already that you need, then you put the barrier of writing custom plugins. If you need to do things like data flow transformations, like a, a typical ETL problem where I just need to do a lot of cleansing, error handling, splitting the data into this stream or another, either cascading, scalding, or pig are pretty well equal for this, but sometimes it, it's, it is fast to write, probably faster to write a pig script if you know pig. However, I guess if I had to learn two, I would pick hide and scalding or cascading because then you have complete flexibility. You're basically working with a Turing-complete language. You need a little extra bit of functionality. You just write it right there as a built-in function. There's no hassles. There's no jumping over the, the fence or the shark to uh, an API that's in a different language, et cetera. OK, just a few more uh, links on sculpting that are too small to read, probably. Um, the first link is to the actual GitHub repo for sculpting. The second link is to the Scalding workshop that I mentioned that I've done, if you really want to dive into it some more. And Paco has also added some uh, Scalding examples to his uh, Cascading for the Impatient, uh, which is a great way to learn Cascading when you're getting started, by the way. Okay, questions? Makes it for either of us, really. I guess you didn't get a chance either. Stone silence. Yes. Um, one of the issues that we ran into with Pig is when you're writing custom UDFs, you have an issue where the data is being arbitrarily like cut off in the middle. How do you handle that in installing? So you mean it looks like the records are being split? Yeah. 
Have you seen that? I don't think I've ever actually seen that myself in, in either. What, what you mean from the splitters, from the raw going into the mapper then, you, you've got a splitter that's, that's arbitrarily so kind of? The UDF like, documentation says that you're supposed to just figure out like if you don't have a complete chunk of data and just find the beginning and then read until you get to the last complete chunk and then the next one you have, you're supposed to read back to get that incomplete piece. So we basically ended up going a different route instead of the UDF because it's a pain. So learning how you handle that is more important as well. Um, I mean, well, generally, that would, we would usually think of it more in terms of, not UDF, but how do you handle it at the tap? Um, so where are you getting the input data from, and are you doing a multi-line splitter, for instance, at that point? Um, yeah, I mean, the problem is our situation, we were pulling data from the MySQL, and we, the only way that we could do it is take the SQL and kind of dump it on us and parse the tuples out. I, I, I feel your pain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what happened is we would get part of a tuple in the UDF, yeah. and it would basically just get thrown out because we couldn't parse it. So we had holes where the mapper had sliced the tuple in the middle. Yeah, I think what he said is maybe the right thing. So the question for the mom at home is, um, I don't know if she'll watch this or not, but anyway, uh, well, you know, sometimes you can get into a scenario with the UDF where it looks like you're getting a split record rather than the whole record. Expect. And probably the solution is to figure out a more robust way to guarantee before you get to that point that the records are whole. It may be that there's some pre-processing in your page script or scalding or whatever that you could do that would uh, make sure that uh, the records are together. I thought you were about to ask for another problem, uh, another common problem where, like, if you can easily write uh, like moving average functions in Pig and Hive, like say I want to average over the last 50 stock records. This is a pretty common thing to do in finance. The tricky part about some of the UDFs like that is you have to make sure that all of the records for a given stock, let's say, end up at the same process, and they're not sharded over different processes or you'll get invalid data. So that's another problem you have to be wary of, but it's not quite the same thing. Are there any other questions? Do you have one, Chip? I just have a question for both of you, because it's based on something from the combination of something from both of your docs. You mentioned the philosophy is Kind of determinism. So you, you want it always to be the same. I think also let the, the optimizer figure out how best to do it. You, don't, you just give the data flow, and you don't tell the optimizer how, how to optimize the data flow. And in this solving example where we're saying the, the map side joint, so map with tiny, does that violate that philosophy that you're talking about? That's a, that's a good point. Um, what Scalding is definitely going to be more, well, so to paraphrase about that, um, that's definitely a difference between like Scalding and cast blog. Cast blog, you can actually change the order of the, the precedence. So it's, it's not too sensitive that you can flip around. You don't want to do that in Scalding because in Scalding, you're actually defining what happens in that pipeline. So they're, yeah, they're very different that way. Um, I, I find that cast blog in practice can be a bit more terse because of that, um, but I guess when we're starting to rely less on cascade under the cover to do the, the optimization or the, the project planning? Probably not, but I think no. this is one of those examples where they just sort of jump the shark a little bit in a good way. Yeah, they've, they've, they've diverged a little bit there, but they, they also have some other great, like algebra and all those yeah. along with it. Um, the thing about optimization, though, is it's kind of at a higher level. Um, so instead of saying join with tiny, there could have been you know, like four different flavors of join with X. Um, and if you know about the shape of the data, you know about the app history, you can go in and say, I don't, I don't want to do a, a co-group is what we would have for a regular join. I want to do a join with tiny. Um, in, in this case, in Scala, we've made that explicit. But if you're using a slightly higher level, like you're doing SQL and then optimizing it down into, into cascading, um, if you knew that the right-hand side of your join was small enough, you could do a memory join. You could, you could do a replicated join. So those are the kind of optimizations that, that we're looking at, is how do you actually specify under the hood what in, in Scalding you would have to make selections for the functions. It just seemed to violate the whole philosophy of, you, you assume you're doing something that's not deterministic because maybe that data ends up scaling larger. And in development, yeah, it's great. It's, yeah. 
it's tiny, but then when you scale to your, your production data, you discover, oh, I made a really bad sense. Yeah, Pig kind of made the same compromises. You, you specify the kind of join you want, whereas normally Pig would try to optimize it. Right. Hives may be a little bit ahead in terms of being smarter about trying to do that for you and not let you get in the way of the compromise. When, when we're talking about optimizing, it's a, a little bit different flavor of, of what, we're, what you would see in Pig. Um, we're talking more about what you do with the tuple flows. There are parts that could be optimized out and how to use like, this is, such a good arrays to not have to propagate a lot of data through.